Thank you for coming. This is our fourth uh, lecture uh, in our design ongoing series for uh, bringing in subject matter experts from around the world uh, with a variety of different design backgrounds. In this case, uh, Professor Glenn Milne has extensive uh, design experience going uh, over 40 years uh, of practice at all levels to include the strategic level for the, uh, the government of Canada, working directly for the Prime Minister on a series of extensive, complex challenges, socio sociologically as well as with infrastructure, logistics, and economies. So um, he's got a, a vast experience not only teaching uh, at the uh, uh, bachelor and graduate level as well as his background in practicing and then also in uh, private business as well in design applications. So uh, amazing wealth of knowledge here. So very excited to have him and uh, turn it over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Ben. <clears throat> I am thrilled to be here because I can't imagine a higher and better use of my uh, experience and um, waking up at 4.30 in the morning for the last two or three weeks with uh, stuff being printed out of some mysterious uh, printer in my mind about what I could say today and what I could do with you. Um, I'm here not to uh, present at you. I am here as much as I can, in the circumstances, work with you and have you walk out of here with more capabilities. Um, I'm a little, yes, of course, uh, I'm a showboater and I love um, the thought that, you know, you really liked it. But, but please keep me on track. I'm here to um, aid and assist uh, your development. So I took architecture at Toronto and um, went into practice and designed, you know, strip malls and apartment buildings and stuff. And then a group of us decided that we wanted to, you know, see the center of the world, so we went to London, England. <coughs> and there, uh, you know, we were flat busted, you know, it had a baby and, and designed a couple of universities and some housing tracks, etc. Then we heard about this mysterious, wonderful place called Finland. So we migrated to Finland, arriving with $17, a Volkswagen bus, a wife pregnant with twins, and a baby in diapers, and made it, Claw, clawed up that wall. But the reason I was in Finland was design, because the dresses, the hats, the buildings, the people, to be in a department store where a lady who is you know, just an ordinary housewife, says, I have uh, a set of glasses by Tapio Vercula, or at least his student, uh, Marie, and I was wondering if, if either of them did something interesting in the way of a picture that could go with them. Wow. And, that, and, and I'm really glad I was lucky to stumble into Finland, because that year, I heard this story. I apologize, sometimes I stray into voices. Our landlord. So in <coughs> the end of World War II, we were retreating from the Russians because the Baltic froze and the tanks came around us. And we had to retreat. And we didn't have gasoline or equipment, with it, but we knew we had to get back to a line. So we would meet at 5 in the morning and say, okay, we look at the maps and tonight or tomorrow morning at 5 o'clock we must be here. And so it's dismissed. And we all went in our own ways. Some went back toward the Russians and stole uh, gasoline from the, from the troops who were not expecting the, 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 the raid and went and took some tractors from the farmer's field and, and they went off. Others who had good boots still, they started marching and they didn't go in for these tricks. But the next morning, we would be there at 5 o'clock, and where they expected perhaps uh, half of us would get there, well, we, we pretty much always got there, maybe not 10%. Another story hit me. The Russians are coming. It's the end of the war. 
The Germans have turned into enemies, not allies. They're being ruthlessly pushed back, and they decide that they will die in a line across Finland rather than become Estonia or Latvia. And so the captain says, okay, we stop here, we make a horseshoe, uh, sorry, uh, an ambush, and it, when they come in the morning, we don't go anywhere. And, and say, Finns don't talk, they just do. So a few minutes later, they call the captain over and they say, we think it's better if the Russians will be looking for an ambush. If we go on that slope and in the snow, then yes, none of us will go home. But I think we think we can get three times as many Russians that way. And that was generic. The participation of everybody in a decision, particularly the die, a die situation. Well, did that ever catch my attention? This caught my attention. The National Defense Strategy 2018. Can I assume everybody's read it? Yes? Did you, did you get the same yellow markers I did about where design showed up? Uh, which was, I, I've only got a few of them here, but it was about uh, 12 times. Now, was that a sea change of some sort, I ask you? But did Mattis say things that the year before would not have been said about independence of action, intellectual leadership, uh, creativity, etc.? I haven't got the right things up there. But is that a shift that you have got to respond to? No. I'm sorry? No. So that's been there? Yeah. Thank you. So in Canada, I came back and went to the University of Pennsylvania, got a master's degree, and then taught at Ohio and North Carolina, and went back and helped start a school of architecture in Ottawa, uh, two of us. And um, I thought I'd be there for life, but two years later, they, they weren't paying me enough to look after my kids, so I stru struck off into consulting. And I picked up a, a, a huge project to review the urban renewal program in Canada and put new sets of programs in its place. And when that was finished, I got picked up by the Prime Minister's office to do a study on demographic objectives. Now, I'll give you a taste of that, but just let me say that, that governance, policy, and strategic initiatives in Canada are the business of the, the brain of the Prime Minister. Now, there are hundreds, thousands of interest groups, political parties, voters, advocates, etc., who want their idea to get into the brain of the Prime Minister. And if you want to think about fertilization, that's not a bad model because the, the sperm have to fight and do better and, and convince and woo, etc., the Prime Minister's brain to get in there and have her decide that that's what she wants to do. And I should tell you, by the way, that in Canada we select, we don't elect a prime minister. They are elected by their political party. And they are, um, they have as much power in a country, 10% like the size of yours, as the president of the USA, because they can do everything and anything. They can spend, direct every nickel, make every decision, every appointment, et cetera, et cetera. Our prime minister makes 5,000 appointments. I suppose your president makes 50,000, um, but these are appointments that are made very directly. So the, our prime minister is the game in town at the national level. Supported, of course, by government departments like transportation or agriculture, central agencies like finance, treasury board, that, I don't know your equivalents quite glibly. A cabinet of ministers who, not unlike your president, are selected um, by the prime minister. Um, but those, that cabinet, by the way, are members of parliament who are selected for that purpose. The 
prime minister is not obliged to have a, these members of parliament, but she can pull somebody in and usually will run her in a seat to become a, a, a the prime minister's office. The, the prime minister has his own or her own friends, etc., and thinkers. Political parties are very important because, of course, they formulate basic propositions about national strategy and governance that are part of their platform and we're often running on an election. This is my model of how the process works, and it's very linear, i.e. suspect. But as a as an advisor to the Prime Minister, I was sometimes given a problem, cold turkey, because of the power of the Prime Minister, I got to work on it without a lot of participation from those other people. For instance, when I was given the problem, please sort out our demographic future, and what can we do about it? What choices do we have? So this is not unlike what I went through. I, I wandered around in the situation, I read all the uh, you know, the, the books on demography and immigration and family planning and morbidity, et cetera, et cetera, and talked to as many people as I could, and then define the basic issues. What things are bumping into what things? Build models, you know, the kind of models that, um, I remember that famous model from Afghanistan, you know, the one with the spaghetti and snakes and ladders and all that sort of thing. That, that's too busy to, to be really helpful, I suspect. But the, that, those kind of models. And then out of all that, our job is to design policy options. Now, I suspect it's the same in the process of coming up with your national defense strategy, that you have to produce options because the person with the pen, the researcher, is not setting the policy, right? But they have to come up with options which encompass the political range of belief, thought, platform, etc. Then our job as, a, as officials is to analyze those options. This option, that option, and that option. How do they work against various criteria? And then cabinet, i.e. the prime minister with company, decides. And then we set up an implementation plan and look at the results, evaluate, and feedback. Does that resonate? Is that a simple model you've got in your own practice? Okay. Well, over the years, I'm, I'm going to run through very quickly some of the projects I did, and it's up to you to see where the design element comes in. So I did that National Urban Study, and then for four years, I helped the Prime Minister think about what he wanted to do, and then I helped him define those priorities into strategic action. And that meant, of course, working with departments, working with uh, the communications aspects of it, et cetera. Then after those four years, I worked for various federal agencies on things like broadcast policy, health policy, you, you name it, policy. I, I was the forest, and still am, the forest gump of Canadian policy. You know, the, who's that guy in the back row? I don't know, he's always in the back row, right? And I, I got a nice reputation, that, 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 something like this. Well, if we're gonna do this, and we don't know what, how, you know, what, we know what the minister wants, but we don't know how to get it together, let's call Glenn and get him to do the graphics. That was a euphemism for, and I really see it now that we've clarified design thinking, let's get Glenn in to pull it all together and turn it into visible options and strategy in a visual thinking way. So I did that for quite a while, and then I, I guess I sort of had a feeling, you don't know Canada, you're not working for Canada unless you're working for the Indians. The Métis, the Inuit, you would call them Eskimos. Um, I don't know if you have Métis, people who are half and half. And, and we, we call our 
folks generally across the board, indigenous. We have three kinds, what you would call Indian, what you would call Eskimo, and the people in the middle, Métis, who were the, uh, uh, literally a nation of people that were brought, brought into this world by Scottish traders and, and, and indigenous uh, women. And they, our province of Manitoba is formed around the Métis fact. Our province of Quebec is formed around the French fact. So we have, if you will, ethnic racial differences built into our country. I help with constitutional negotiations because Quebec was thinking of seceding. So we formed a team of twice as many people as there are in this room and started thinking through what's our position? How are we going to cope with the Quebec uh, positions? Along the way, I got picked up by companies, voluntary organizations, etc., to do their equivalent of national strategy. Then this came along, foresight studies. You all are familiar with that concept? Well, foresight studies are arduous, disciplined ways of creating scenarios out in time from today, this is today, and that's 40 years, 30, 40 years out, that are plausible. They're not, they're not desirable, they're not uh, catastrophic, they're plausible. And, and how you build those is very interesting. You go up, let's say uh, the first one I worked on was energy. We talked to 300 people across the country in clusters of 6 to 12 about everything from batteries to the internal combustion engine to transmission technologies to heating systems, etc., etc. And if you can imagine a pool table the size of this floor down here covered with pennies, that's how many hunches we gathered from all those scientists entrepreneurs, government officials, et cetera, et cetera, on what the energy system could be. And then we clustered them and clustered them and reclustered them until we found these sensible um, scenarios. Well, what are they good for? Well, if you have a good set of scenarios for the energy future, you can do your energy strategy for today in a lot better way. You've got something to reflect against. You'll see a list later on. And along the way, I started bugging uh, our Royal Military College about the fact that there was a great correlation uh, between military and, and design, and that they should start thinking about it. So I, 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 I sort of bought myself in by writing essays, position papers on things like peacekeeping in Haiti. Um, and they really liked what I wrote, so I, I gradually you know, got invited to more and more things. Is that useful to know where I'm coming from that way? Is that? Okay. So here's the demographic objectives, and here's where you see the design thing coming, streaking in. Because here we were, and we figured out that if we cut our immigration net immigration down to zero to 50,000 a year, our population by 1971, about 100 years ago, this is back in 71, it's in 1971, by 2071 it would be about uh, oh, 20 to 25 million. But I, one of the customs in Canada is that when you put the options in front of the Prime Minister and, and Cabinet, you promote one of them because it's your conviction that that's the right one. So this was my conviction that was the right one and my boss. So uh, uh, it would seem that, that a department ordinarily would put this forward under a cabinet minister, but several departments had failed, so I put it forward in the name of the prime minister. And they liked this option. That would mean that around this time, we would be coasting around uh, 30 million. Well, we're up to 35, 36. What do you think happened? Two weeks after they decided on the, you know, the option we recommended, a minister 
but Monique Bejean, walks into the Prime Minister's office and says, you know, the more immigrants we have, the longer we stay in power. And Mr. Trudeau says, really? Keep those dastardly Conservatives out of office by simply opening the gates and bringing more people in, having what you call chain immigration, we call it family reunification? Yes. He said, well, I think that's a good idea. Let's keep those dastards out. So they opted for higher levels of immigration. And today, we are, imagine that you, your country was importing a net three million people a year. Well, that's what we're doing. We're importing net 300,000 people a year. And they come from all over the world. I can say hello and thank you in 50 languages. And I learned them all in about a six block radius in Ottawa, which is not even a particularly, you know, polygot city. So if you go to Canada and you haven't been for a while, welcome to Variety Village. Now, that was immigration. Politics drove that. Here's the analysis, by the way, of those various options. You know, let's grow a little bit, let's grow a medium amount, let's grow a lot. And we tested those options against energy, the environment, uh, tourism, uh, agriculture, you know, markets, effect on Aboriginal people, social dimensions, uh, regional dimension, global politics, etc. And what I did was I asked every department of government to look at those options and decide on whether or not, well, on their view of which, which of those options would be best for their particular responsibilities. So that's a pretty big job. I mean, it meant that, that I had to bring in all kinds of architecture students to interview those departmental officials and put together the reports. I was lucky. I had this force of ants called architecture students at three bucks an hour that I could apply to anything. And of course, they're brilliant, right? So they, they did all that. Well, immigration politics meant that we started up this ladder, and as soon as, the, here's the design element, as soon as they decided on that humongous sea change in immigration levels, my little buzzer went off. So I went down to Toronto, and I wandered around. The boss says, you're gonna what? I want to wander around. Well, the boss knew me well enough to say, let us know what happens. So I wandered around Toronto, and I asked bartenders and cops and taxi drivers, and my uncle Archie, he's always good, what will happen if we get this mixed flood of people coming in? And, and, they, and the consensus was, well, not unlike England, where there was a lot of trouble with Caribbean uh, people coming in and you know, friction and riots and stuff, we, we will probably have a lot of trouble. Aha, ethnic tensions. So we defined it as a cabinet problem, and we farmed it out to a department to help us decide what to do about it. And fortunately, um, a friend who's in Vancouver Island, and the two of us are quite an interesting contrast in, in size, he and I had lunch, and we decided that rather than seeing this collision of peoples as a, a problem, we would recast it there's a favorite design for you. We would reframe it as multiculturalism, as a positive virtue of Canada. So we're off and running. And that, dear friends, is how you shape a country, a little tiny one of only 30 million people. Now, I don't think that's in your... <laughs> oh, maybe it is. It's <laughs> Sorry, um... They have grabbed the, uh, the other one. Oh, okay, the battery. Yeah, there we go. Design. Design applied to a political platform. The Prime Minister went away with his best friend, who was also a senior public servant, and they had a weekend conversation. And they came back, and his friend, the clerk of the Privy Council, which is to say our senior public servant, wrote up the note of what they talked about that weekend. And nobody could understand the note. So somebody brought it and put it on my desk and said, can you make anything out of this? So what I made out of it 
was this that he they had been talking at various levels about the nation state, about the role of government in, in delivering services and goods, uh, and, and privileges and rights and regulation and law to individuals. And the issues that were inherent in that, like an attractive, you know, the physical environment versus entrepreneurial uh, uh, opportunity, the right to health versus the right to work, smokestacks versus etc. A viable ecosystem versus economic growth. So that helped the Prime Minister see the issues. Now, unfortunately, I, I did six of those sheets, and the Prime Minister took those seats, six sheets and decided to have some Rooseveltian fireside chats. And he put a sheet in front of them, and he, they turned on the camera, and he had a nice conversation with Canadians about opportunities and the issues that were faced. And that lasted 20 minutes. And, and the hook came out and took him off during it bombed. Everybody went to sleep. It was linear. It was stupid. It was not political. It didn't work. However, this one did work. They came back from an election. They were just hopping. They had won a majority of the seats and they didn't expect to. And they were, the ministers were, had been told at 10 o'clock, you're in the cabinet, show up at the Governor General's at 11 o'clock, get sworn in, and your first meeting is at 2 o'clock this afternoon. And as a secretariat, we had set that meeting up. And when they walked in, out in the hall, before they actually went to work in the room, they were just bustling. It was like Gilbert and Sullivan, you know, the uh, trial by jury, you know, the scene. Hey, did you see that? We got six seats down there in Oxford County with that goof old Sorry, gee, congratulations for getting those seats. Oh, West, we had that grain program, and then we got inside them, socialists left, and they didn't even see it coming, and we won two seats where we never won a seat before, et cetera, et cetera. They're all excited. So then we opened the doors, and we ushered them into a room about this size, and a table about that big, with old badges on the edge that say things like, Minister of Furs, Minister of Fish, you know, a heritage room. And in front of each one of them, there's this much paper. Welcome to Termite. Welcome to chewing the paper that has been prepared for you to consider and to wrestle with by departments. These people down here. So afterwards, the boss says, uh, how do you think that went? And there's four or five of us around the table who are the central thinkers, right? And everybody said, well, I think it went pretty well, you know. It would, it, they were quite pleased with to be, you know, obviously to be selected, you know, this morning. And here they are this afternoon, hard at work. Glenn, what's wrong with you? Monday was better. What do you mean Monday's better? Well, never mind. Yes, tell us. What do you mean Monday's better? Well, Monday, we had taken our architecture students out to a park and we'd set up some easels and we had shown them the program we were going to give them for their third year of architecture studio and asked them to go away and think about it and come back with their ideas and they did and so we wrote their ideas up with our ideas and turned them into a program that was uh, you know a, a product of both of us and off we went and you know somebody at the table says he wants to facilitate cabinet. I said, no, I don't. The boss says, just a second. So what we did was, we asked the prime minister for permission. We went out and we interviewed all those lucky people who had just become cabinet ministers and asked them, what would you like to do with the next four years? And they told us. And we brought that stuff back and I wrote it up on, you know, big sheets of paper and put it in a room about this big. And we spun our chairs around, and we could see the pattern of what they'd said. And then we took the synthesis of that to the Prime Minister and said, what do you think? And he said, great, that looks good to me. And I also said, I don't want them in that room again. Let's find them a place where they can be in sneakers and sweaters and have a drink on the table at lunchtime. Oh, what do you mean? So we started looking around for a place, and we found some empty 
magnificent old cottages on a lake near Ottawa called Meech Lake. And we confiscated, sorry, we borrowed those buildings from the, 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 the national authority that owned them. And we got our students and wives to fix them up. And we held the meeting that, where they looked at the priorities in that building, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if this was a Canadian audience, there would be a few gasps because the, the word Meech Lake means a lot because that's where we happened to find those buildings and later it was the scene of a constitutional face-off that, that I was accidentally part of. So there's how elected members who became cabinet ministers were involved in setting priorities and then what, what we did was we, we had a network of public servants who we brought over on Friday afternoons. Our building, of course, was the equivalent of a hill, you know. And we brought them over on Friday afternoons and we'd serve beer and peanuts and we'd talk about just about anything. And they become, became our network of actually designing the responses to the priorities for government to consider. Another project. You see how it runs out here. This is pre-internet, but that diagram helped the Minister of Communications understand why they needed to change the Broadcast Act to manage the changing technology of communications. Here's design again. We had a team that were trying to figure out a very broad target, very broad framework for national economic development. And of course, we thought in economic terms of natural resources, processed resources, products, and services. And this brain said, I don't think that includes things like putting nuclear waste in the ground for 20,000 years. That's not, a, that's not a, a natural resource, that's a natural load. And I don't think it includes things like the intellectual property that's being put on disks or into AI or into the, you know, the, the IT systems. So we broadened out the concept of what the economy carries, does, and then we did it in terms of levels. In, this, in the natural resource area, are we exploitive or are we making things better as we go along? In Finland, by the way, when they do a forest, the forest comes out further ahead. They selectively grab trees, they chew up the waste and put it back as, as uh, you know, fertilizer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so they're up around this level. And oh, by the way, 95% um, of the forest industry technology in Canada comes from Finland because they are they were pushing up this level. So I, I had the, the moment for a little while where a couple of ministers fought over whose great idea this was. And of course, like everything else, these things, well, something I can tell you, at that geo, sorry, at that strategic level of national policy, people change their mind every six months. I think because I've watched them do it for 40 years. <laughs> you know, and I, there's no theory behind that one. This was a nice contribution. A friend from the military came and said, help us define where missions and campaign instructions come, come from. So as it turns out, um, and I'll turn this around. And, is this a, is this a, uh, we made was to see that in this day and age of instant communications, if something happened here, like there's smoke coming out of a synagogue in Montreal, 
and we can't get in, uh, there's an alert. This is the PM up here. Well, um, it, it just could be that one of the PM staff is watching a television set in the next room. And she walks in and tells the PM, we got trouble. And of course, that alarm goes to a, a situation room center where there's a protocol established for how to respond to it. And local police and our, uh, this is obviously an international incident, so our Department of what we call Global Affairs, for your, your state, uh, et cetera, would get alerted. And this network then goes off, and there are cadres of ministers who are responsible to look at proposals that are brought forward to them within minutes, who are called in uh, you know, or put on, on live, et cetera. So that turned out to be a, just defining how it worked and presenting this model uh, turned out to be a, a design service, if you will, uh, something that really helped uh, the, the security side. Well, you've heard a lot about this already. I get a group together, I facilitate them, I ask them questions, I pull their ideas out, I build them up as a good facilitator would, and then we go home. I get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, I come in, and the walls are covered with the sheets, and I sit in there and say, okay, Big Mouth, you said you would turn this into a comprehensive strategy by 9 o'clock. Do it. And that's how I got less and less hair, because I grabbed myself and just, you know, hit my head on the table and forced myself to come up with a product. I learned very early that I had some weird ability to sense where the Prime Minister was going why he was doing things. It was all about body language. The fact that his wife and my wife were having coffee together helped a little bit. Um, the business of littering the hill with charts, flip charts that have things half thought through, rooms with cards on matrices indicating what the priorities were, so that when you walked around the rooms, of, it's called the Privy Council office, it's the cabinet office, you, you couldn't help but be steeped in the action and the possibilities. And that really, that really helped. But yes, like the rest of us, I, I, you know, I can do the systems, and I'm going to show you a little later on a new kind of, or a different kind of way of looking at systems I call market models. Um, we read everything, of course, and high reading speed helps. And stay out of the way of reporters, because they'll suck you in and put their fangs in every time. Um, you've already heard me that if, you know, if we had a, like I started working on a national land use policy, I showed up in every provincial capital. And, you know, hi, oh, who are you? Well, I work for, for the PCO. I just came out to talk. Does anybody want to talk about land use? Are you real? Are you, like you haven't got a date? No, I just yeah, I just wander around, you know, scum kid. Well, it worked because people are glad to see a human being instead of a letter, and you can find your way. I even did that in the French Prime Minister's office. I literally wandered in and told this receptionist where I worked and what I was interested in doing in terms of finding out what the French were doing about demography. And first thing you know, I've got some brat who's about 23 and has got a degree from Oxford as well as, uh, you know, NARC and the Sorbonne and all that. I'm very rigorous about always looking at what the competition is doing. Because it's Australia or New Zealand or Finland or Sweden or France or Turkey or South Africa or Iraq. There might even be a model about how things are done in one of those upset countries that would be very interesting to you. It sure doesn't hurt your brain to find out how they are implicitly doing their strategy work. I always had one or two close intellectual buddies, as well as an intelligent wife, to sort of listen to, share things, uh, be silly with, etc. And I've already mentioned that we set up networks 
beer and peanuts, people who, of course, if, you, if you're working for the PM, it's a lot easier to say, would you like to come over on Friday? Thought you'd never asked, <laughs> you know, et cetera, right? And, and these guys, these architecture students, you know, if we ran into, like, we've got this much paper to eat by Monday and some summaries to produce, they were just marvelous at three bucks an hour. And fortunately, the security system was, was totally compromised because the head of security uh, and, and my secretary were, uh, were girlfriend and boyfriend. So whenever I brought a gaggle of architecture students in, he'd say, they look like those people to me, stamp, and, we, and we, they were in. There's a definition of design thinking. I, I assume everybody's going to get this material. Yes, sir. I'll be, uh, we'll, we'll get a PDF of this and provide it, and then I'll... Yeah. In Ottawa a couple weeks ago, there was a conference where Ben and I, Ben was the superstar. I was in, uh, also ran. And I, I put this definition together uh, with a, a lot of reading of the literature, talking to artists, talking to myself, et cetera, et cetera. Trying to identify the parts of the brain, and the science tells us, you know, that this canvas and that canvas and that canvas all do various things like memory and, and decision making and stuff like that. Well, I, I gave up on trying to identify them per se, but it's, it's, there are sections which are intuition, memory, and analysis. And I hope everybody, I guess everybody has read Daniel Kahneman, Fast Thinking, Slow Thinking. It's, yeah, you know, it's current and best, and yes, like everything else, you know, it's it's a perspective from careful thinkers without much evidence behind it except careful thinking. But it is stimulating and it feels right, you know, about the way the mind works. But what I also picked up was that playful, thoughtful making is the essence, is the vehicle for that design thinking. Successive approximations of the design product, which are outside of your mind. They start off as scribbles, they end up being rolled out of hangers and tested. But you, you, I, I, can, I, I exhort you to consider that all design thinking that's successful includes successive approximations of the product. And it's raggedy and you have to go back, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I also can, I'm going to sell you on something I hope today, which is the use and the nature of facilitation, because it does the same thing with the same principles of playful thinking, fantastic thinking, <coughs> inclusive thinking, bringing memory <coughs> and new ideas, et cetera, et cetera, together. So that's a summary of how I would work in government. I would always go and find the folks who knew, and I didn't care where I found them. I mean, I, I would bring in, you know, my brother's ski buddy because he just happened to be really good at thinking on certain topics, or he represented somebody who was impacted by this potential uh, policy. And I mentioned, you know, the, the trick of pull it all together as best you can with the group. You don't suggest anything. You ask for their observations, ideas, and put them up on the wall and let them draw things together. But then at the end of the day, pull it together for them. And I can tell you that Synectics based facilitation, that's a company in Boston, easily cuts the time of meetings in half or, or to a third of what they ordinarily are and easily doubles the effectiveness and if you will, the volume of output of people getting together. And because it's based on listening, respect, supporting each other's ideas initially, and then raising your concerns, nudging the process along quickly so nobody's bored, and boy, am I ever breaking the rules, here I am yelling at you as opposed to facilitating. Um, it infects an organization with considerate leadership, innovation, and respect. It's really funny. As soon as 
facilitation becomes a norm, and it is in many places in the government of Canada, then the attitude and relationships between everybody changes. And you know what? I, so far, I've just asked around a little bit. I'm, I'm sorry to say that I think the military is in the Middle Ages. Somehow or other, this has passed you by. And everybody out there that's doing well in Silicon Valley or Disney, one of my students went to Disney and became a red-hot uh, experience designer. And I, he came back for a reunion, and I was sucking up. I said, gee, Gary, uh, any chance of getting invited to Disney to do a, a facilitation gig? Oh, Glenn, uh, thanks. We've got some pretty good facilitators, and we, have the, we use them all the time. I'll pay, Gary. I'll just, how much do you want to get me in there just <laughs> once, you know, et cetera. You're not that, I think Tampa's close to Orlando, isn't it? Yeah. You might be a little, okay. When you get the, when you get the material, scan that. Just pick a few of them. If you have, one of the things about facilitation is that at, from, at a certain moment, you ask the group for, a, for some fantastic ideas. And then you bring them into reality. If you start off with a fairly flat, ordinary, dumb idea and push it uphill, try to get to some sort of nice, feasible, innovative, inexpensive breakthrough idea, well, in just literally, you know, the ergs involved in pushing that hunk of lead that looks like a pancake uphill just don't pay off. If you get the fantasy going, then it's downhill. It's, you know, well, I, okay, wait a minute. There's something in what she just said. For instance, I was facilitating a famous entertainer in Canada who had been fired by the network. And there came a moment when I said to her, what would you really do if you suddenly had two million bucks? What would you really do? He's saying, what would you do if you had suddenly two million bucks? Well, I, I, I'd have my own show. And what would you do? Well, I do a very good interview. I do interviews. And boom, a show called Pam Wallen Live was born in that moment. Because somebody else at the table had said, I know people on Bay Street, Wall Street, who would love to back that project, et cetera, et cetera. But by getting her to fantasize, so he, he, these, these are the, I'm not telling you the principles of facilitation as they are in practice. I'm telling you why or what they're built on. And this is the theme of my lecture today. Use human instincts. Don't use your rational Cartesian, platonic brain. In a platonic relationship, it doesn't happen, does it? But if you have the strong urge that, you know, that you're going to do that person, it tends to happen. And it's that urge, those instincts that I'm asking you to work with in the military. These are some of the, when you see this, like, people come to the meeting, and they're just dying to tell you that they know something special. And suddenly you get this question out of nowhere. Well, what about the Hertzenbergers? Huh? Were we talking about Hertzenbergers? Well, I'm glad you asked, because you see the Hertzenbergers, you know, they, they want to tell. So you build it into the agenda. It's tell time, it's ask time, it's solve time. And it, it works with human nature. People shut down in the face of bullies, bores, and repetition, right? Well, a facilitator knows how to make sure that doesn't happen. And if it starts to happen, oh, the, the bully will feel okay because she's been listened to and it's acknowledged and, and, and they move on. So that, that, that's a list of all the things that happen in meetings that, that don't happen in a well-facilitated meeting. Oh, here's a scene. There's a patrol outside the wire. And they're walking, and they've got to get down there. Suddenly, out of nowhere, and there's nobody supposed to be in range to do that, there's a sniper opens up on them. So they 
the five of them tumble into the edge of a wadi and sit there. And the patrol leader says, shit, we didn't see this coming and there, we don't have anything. There's nothing in the, uh, the doctrine or in the, uh, you know, in the, in the uh, ROE for this. Okay, you know what we're going to do. Take a knee. Ridiculous takes a knee. 60 seconds, shut up and think. Okay, scribble your, scribble your idea. Give me those pieces of paper. She puts them down. Jesus. Fred, that's great. Okay, we got it. Uh, this is what we're going to do. That was almost real time. That's facilitation in action at the point. And of course, there's facilitation places I've described it, you know, at HQ or with the general staff or whatever. So I'll drop that subject. Here's a toy that I'm going to just touch on. The use of continua. Extrapolation. I, I designed this instrument in 60 seconds. These are all the things that government does that you can choose from. It does critical interventions like war, flood, famine. It provides infrastructure that enables a society to operate. It makes vital investments in information, education, health, safety, etc. It supports a society which has economic activity and an environment that is contained in. And society can be seen as everything from our ephemeral, uh, we're proud of them, uh, values as Americans to protecting the straits for our shipping. The infrastructure ranges from values and identity and heritage through institutions, the banks, the schools, the JSOU, et cetera, as, as, as an institution where, which is also a marketplace, of course, for ideas and transaction and of information and skills. Boom, boom, boom. And then I thought, well, something's missing here. Okay, the role of government is to put some sort of ring of collective priorities and vision around all that. That sort of thinking enabled me to suggest a better, sorry, an alternative way of managing nuclear waste to a group of scientists who are the best in the world. Because I asked them, well, what are you doing? And they said, well, we're doing this. And, and, and what were you doing? Well, we were doing this. So I just, I, I, I believe that anybody can do this. I just asked my mind. If you extrapolate the direction that that technology is moving in, what have you got here? And so I turned to them and I said, have you been thinking about what happens to a molecule when it is pushed through another molecule by chemical, radioactive, mechanical forces, can it come out the other side intact, even though it's theoretically been hemmed in by that molecule? They started yelling, you know. You from Stanford? How come you know that? Who, I thought you were just an architect. Well, anybody can do what I just did. It just, to, you know, it's extrapolation, and you can, you can dig it later on. Yes, all of us should be able to whip together a systems model of what we're talking about on a piece of paper, right? Now, I don't want you to sit there and think, well, he's just being a smart ass. He can do those things and the rest of us can't. Honestly, anybody can do this. Some of the foresight studies that I worked on, demographic objectives, bio, info, nano, quantum energy, the national economy, annual health. And every time we found that the group that I was working with, the representation visually enabled design thinking as well as a common understanding. What's my time? So you got about 10 minutes left. Okay. Here's my pitch. I was looking at some seagulls on a field. I was looking at some dolphins in a bay. I was looking at fish. I was looking at 
the people who sell flowers outside of my window in Ottawa. They're competing with each other for selling flowers. But then bad weather comes and they're trying to figure out how to keep the market open for a little while longer in October. So they start borrowing techniques from each other for keeping the flowers from freezing. Or some flowers don't come in from Venezuela and all of a sudden the person who got all the daffodils is sharing them out amongst the other vendors, the competitors. Well then I started looking carefully at markets, human, particularly the market of the, fa you know, the faculty around the table. Well, we're here to collaborate and to help each other out with our with 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 teaching. Yeah. And what else? Well, of course, you know, the people in the squad are in competition with each other. Of course they're trading skills and things and, and, and knowledge. Of course they're collaborating. Okay, you and me, what we're gonna do is, of course they're learning. Hey, look at that. That bird knows how to get a frozen worm out of the ground. Let's watch what she's doing and, and we can do it too. And of course there's cheating, right? Um, it's a great institution of male, female, and male, male, and female, female, and all the other relationships. But there, there are institutions and there are rules, the infrastructure is all set. And once in a while we find ourselves, you know, we can't help it, we're just mar market creatures cheating. And we share the infrastructure of the rules, the institution, like the institution of, let's go for a coffee. It's an institution, isn't it? Certain things happen in that circumstance. Okay, I'm asking you to think about the market at perspective, the market analysis, when you're doing your organizational development work, when you're looking at your ROE, when you're looking at a class full of baby generals or whatever. Now, I applied that market concept to the federal government marketplace. Here are the departments. Here are all the political inputs. Here are the inputs from the past, the momentum. Here are the outputs of new legislation, spending and programs, etc. And it transformed the way government sees itself in Canada. I just love it. Every poli-sci book, or most poli-sci books in Canada, they phone up and they say, <coughs> could we use that diagram? <laughs> but market thinking enabled me to bat this together so fast it wasn't funny. You know, there's the, you can see the processes built in there and the Prime Minister, she's, her brain is all important, et cetera, et cetera. How do you decide where to balance the system with that? I'm sorry? How do you decide where to bound a system with that? Because everything could be in that system, and then it becomes overly complicated. Well, I, I decided the bounds by the nature of these, of government itself. There are its departments. There are the mechanisms for consultation. I could, you know, in other words, this goes from hard to medium to soft. And as you can see, these folks out here think they don't have much influence at all, but what they do if they get together advocate with that particular, I hope you like this one. We're going to export democracy to the Middle East. Oops, sorry. Well, my observation, again, continuum thinking, is that governance is pretty good up here in Scandinavia in terms of, uh, let's see, what does it say? Collaborative vision, transparency, universal education, development, and full participation in everything. And why is Norway doing so well in the Olympics? Equality. Those nations are devoted to the notion that everybody will be equal, not have the opportunity to be equal. Here we have US and Canada, demographic authority, the rule of law. Here we have Singapore. The rule of law is made public, but it's run by a cabal who decide who's going to be in next time around. 
I call it the golf club model. Order imposed by a power group leader or outside intervener, Saudi, et cetera, et cetera. Internal agreements on authority between various factions in the marketplace. Ongoing power battles amongst gangs and other power groups like Somalia. The emerge oh, here's England, 1215. Magna Carta, where the, the, the robber barons got together and said, hey, we got to stop fighting like this. Let's get a capo del capo, we'll call him the king, and we'll straighten out the property, the property rights and, and who gets what. Well, look how long it has taken England to get from there to somewhere in there. So what this, this was received very well for this by the Center for atmospheric studies in Washington and a couple of other places, because what it means is that when you're designing a mission, objective, campaign design or whatever, maybe you're trying to you identify the fact that they're at this level, and if you get them to this level, where there's, the, let's say, an agreement amongst some warlords on how they're going to run the country more effectively and how they're going to cut down on the blood bath and, and and, and regularize the corruption, then you can declare success for that mission and get out. This is not a model of how Washington works. It's far too organized. I did try to write a book with another Diplomat with a diplomat about how Washington works, and he was just too busy and too rich, he couldn't do it. But it, it did look a lot like that, where there's, it's like the the, the water below the the falls at, at Niagara, things appear and disappear. The powers of the president, the powers of the House of Representatives, the powers of Congress, the powers of the Joint Chiefs, uh, the DOD, etc. How they, they, and you know how things can appear and disappear in Washington there. That you think they're gone, and all of a sudden they're funded and they're up, like 300 billion. It came like a leviathan out of the deep, didn't it? So if you intervene in a foreign market, you have to do a lot of careful mapping. And the CIA site's a good start, but pe people on the ground, uh, however you do it, if you're going to go in there and help them stabilize and move up a notch or two, this is what you're coping with. My recommendations. Please favor, in, when you're developing people, developing instinctive skills rather than methods. I call them platonic methods for the reason I mentioned. Far better, I think, to have Facilitation plus design skill sets and instincts built into everybody all the way up. So that they can listen, understand, get people to pull stuff from everybody. Whether it's, you know, the, the, that, that council you have with the, the elders in Afghanistan or the, the folks in Washington. Now, I'm, I'm taking a chance on my friendships here because I, I see a lot of methodologies that I call design recipes that are pretty much pre-cooked. And you pull people in and you have them go through these steps. Next, we build models. And then after that, we identify options in the models. And then we do an assessment of the models. And then we hack the machine. Or then we, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, I'm asking you to favor instinctive skills over that. When you're doing planning of any kind, many stakeholders, this is the worst kind of planning. You know when the guys say, "Well, let's you let's get this let's get this done in a hurry, okay? Let's create, oops, let's create a, a, a space. I think uh, what we got going here is a high intervention, a low intervention." Um, Locals involved, locals not involved, and I think this is our space. Thank you.
I suggest, I mean, I, I, all along when I was developing this over the last three weeks, I kept saying facilitation. And then I kept saying, Glenn, be honest. It's facilitation plus design. That's what you're hustling for. That's what you're promoting. So I, I suggest you try to figure out some way to have a little test case, a pilot program that where you're training people in this skill and instinct side and see what happens. I'm assuming that you're always looking at the competition, whether it's friendly or full. And then my last recommendation is take the national defense strategy and play with it. What didn't Mattis say? What options seem to have been pushed off the table? Red team. Somebody else is red teaming it right now. China, Russia. Why don't you, you, of course you'll work with it. Or you can develop a whole bunch of scenarios for implementation. I saw one article that popped up the other day on the net about you know, the, the strategy applied to the Pacific. And somebody had started thinking. What are the implicit policy objectives? Because quite frankly, it's a very descriptive document. It's not a principled document. It says, you know, we're going to be the toughest and the best, and we're going to fight on conventional and unconventional grounds, and we're going to have our guys in good shape. Is that good enough in terms of really understanding in an insightful way what's in that document and what's not in it? Thank you.